ladies and gentlemen, tonight's performance includes misunderstood genitalia, snake arms, and a discomforting conversation about ancient racism. Uh, seriously, this episode is a lot. It might not be for everyone. Anyway, all this and more on this episode of Created Things. <laughs> Good tidings to the gentle listener, and welcome to Created Things, the only podcast where you can't tell if we are technically half goat because the video version of this podcast only shows up for, uh, shows us from the chest up. I am your host, artist and psychotherapist, Jacob Flores Popcheck. With me, as always, is my devilish brethren, Father Gabriel Toretta, medievalist, uh, friar, fun guy. How you doing, dude? Um, yeah, I'm most of those. I would say most of those. Yeah. Um, one of my novel classmates um, insisted on calling me goat feet um because yeah mm -hmm. uh still does actually that was a long time ago but he still does um because we were the only people who would be up late at night and um he, i was much quieter than him and so i would sneak up on him um and uh and scare the crap out of him late at night and he was the kind of guy who assumed that when he was up what he assumed was by himself at like one in the morning that um any noises he heard were um demons oh sure that kind of guy yeah which is a pretty reasonable assumption and um and so one time i came up on him at about one in the morning and um uh scared him as one does and uh he nearly had a heart attack he's a pretty large guy uh he nearly had a heart, had a heart attack and from that moment on he called me Pete. so there it is don't goats famously have cloven hooves and therefore they would be technically hard it would be hard for them to sneak up on technically, someone technically it's hard to imagine why being like able to sneak up on somebody trans mutes into being a goat because yeah having a news flash when you wake up and you have hooves you will find that life is significantly noisier than it was before. Um, yeah, this is sort of a, a you also have is metamorphosis type of a situation. Yeah, like you, you wake, wake up, up you know, and that's it's one like, of the inconveniences. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like you woke up and you have hoofs, and you realize, like, huh, I am actually kind of loud. Is it hoofs or hooves? Well, should you we know, spend the whole episode debating that? I feel like that would than behoove us, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Oh, I well, did actually, that. this this whole thing about um, what goats actually cannot do, hmm. despite what people say, is is actually going to be a major theme of this episode uh, because in this next installment of our spooky October series, our Spooktober series, we can call I, it a, we like call it an Oktoberfest. Because why not? Yeah, Oktoberfest. Well, it's not in September. Aren't Oktoberfest always in September? We are. Yeah, but um, Americans don't know that, so it works. Should we call it Spooktoberfest? We could call that. that. I could. I could. All right. Oc so in this Oc next Oktoberfest. Ox spook fest. That sounds <laughs> much Deutsch. more. That sounds Och. much more. Yeah, Deutsch. Ox spook All right. fest. Yeah. So in this next installment of Ox spook fest, created things Ox spook fest, um, we are kind of following up uh, a double episode we did back, I think, in the spring or early summer about um, angels in art that uh, was was pretty popular and that uh, taught me a lot and um, that kind of opened up inadvertently a lot of really uh interesting and in my mind uh hilarious conversations about how demons are depicted and i was i think back then i was like you know we need to stop talking so much about why satan is so hot in all of these pieces of works of art that we're talking about we should probably save <laughs> that for a whole episode Awkward. on demons right yeah um right and so when we were right. talking about uh content for ox uh just named so um 
we of course went back to this idea of demons and devils in art. Right. So we're getting ghoulies, we're getting ghosties, we're getting devils and demons and ne'er do wells. How often do they do well? Ne'er. Ne'er. Uh, ne'er. I asked ne'er. them. I asked them. I, I asked my best friend who who, who <laughs> ne'er does well, and he was like, well, actually, my friend ne'er. Yeah, Nair, Nair does well. He does I thought, well. A I thought lot. about it. I thought about it once or twice, but I thought in the end, like then I'd be a sometimes do well. No. So, Nair. So so yeah, goats are a big theme here. Mm-hmm. Uh, sexy hotness is, is a big theme here. I'm very excited to unpack why demons are so present in art history and always so uh, bafflingly weird. And so different from how I personally conceive of demons. I think that's a really jarring thing for me Um, because obviously you and I are religious people. We both believe uh, in in demons or demonic entities, spirits of that sort. Um, Not everyone does, uh, but I don't conceive of them the way they are so often depicted. Um, And maybe that would be a good place to start. Can we just like, elevator pitch like what we're saying demons actually are versus what people might perceive them to be or or imagine or assume we think they are because that's yeah. probably totes good with so that. step one demons are angels end of story demons are angels point you know punct period um the thing about this kind of angels that demons are is that like when God gave them their first act, well, so they're born free, they're born in grace, they're born able to see God in his essence, um, or kind of, it's complicated. Um, anyway, they're able to know how good God is, um, and that's it. Um, and they they look at God, and they look at themselves, and they say... Gosh, I'm just so friggin' hot. And like in the very first act of their being, they choose rather than following God to pursue their own good. And then that makes them evil because they want something other than God. Um, and so they're angels, but just like messed up angels, you know? Um, right. And in our conception, it's not like, oh, you know. I mean, I guess, you know, God is goodness, right? So they're rebelling against the goodness yo, itself. Yo, yo, yo. So when, so when they decide, like, man, maybe not, it's kind of like, well, you know, there's this amazing steak in front of me, but there's an actual pile of rotting feces with maggots crawling out of it, and I would prefer to eat that. Right. And of course, there are lots of folk traditions and folk theories and different religious groups will say different things about why demons rebelled or, you know, what what caused them to do so or in what capacity and, and, and you know, varying degrees of fairy tale nish ness mm-hmm. enters into there. But I mean, I think we can just basically assess, hey, these are fallen angels. These are spirits in resistance to God to god yeah. and therefore in resistance to goodness and love. yeah yeah who were made to be very beautiful and very good um who chose to live as very ugly um which is very mm-hmm. important for the history of how they're depicted in art um and just essentially for what they are is that they were made to be very good chose to be very bad um and so made to be very beautiful chose to live as very ugly what are you gonna do it's life um one of the things though that i um that I conceive in particular about demons, or at least infer, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that and this is th- this is partially coming from. So C.S. Lewis did this great book, The Screw Tape Letters. Um, mm-hmm. I recommend reading it it's if great you book, haven't. Yeah. Um, but so my my sort of assessment is, you know, demons, though they're depicted in media of all forms as being, you know, sort of tempters and they want to tempt us. It's not because they necessarily love evil or want us to experience, you know, sexy things or delicious things. You know, the, the witch has that great, uh, that great scene, uh, dost thou want the taste of butter, right? It's not cause like Satan really wants me to try butter. It's Satan it's wants you to try butter. Don't try butter. Right. Butter is dangerous. Yeah, don't try butter. But like there is this implication that demons rejoice in us doing wicked things 
because it hurts God, right? Like if well, you and it hurts I us. Were, like he just got just the demons want us to do the same thing that we did, you know. So it's kind of like did, yeah, that they did, yeah. So it's kind of like I mean, you know, hurts when us, you, hurts God, yeah. When you like all the dudes in the room, like moment of moment of self awareness here, like the last time you open opened like a milk jug. And you put it to your face and you were like, oh my gosh, that is so unspeakably nasty. And then you, because it's like rotten, right? This is the least universal experience I've ever heard of. And then your first response is that you turn to the person next to you and you say like, you've got to smell this. Ah, okay. Right. That's like, a pretty good comparison. This is this is what dudes do. Women, it turns out they don't do this. They have their own ways of doing it, but they they don't do this. Um, they find it very confusing usually. Um, but uh, but basically, like you smell something unspeakably horrible, um, and as a man, your first response, ninety nine out of a hundred times, will be like, "Oh my gosh, you got to smell this." I don't know. My wife definitely does that, perhaps for, more than I do. Good for her. Or maybe we're just maybe we're good just progressive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So like, but th- this is how the demons are. They say like, "Oh my gosh, you got to smell this. It's the smell of burning in hell forever. You're gonna love it." And they know you won't, but they want you to. Yeah. yeah well, is. and that's the thing. Like, it's not sort of a because I had a you know an, an atheist buddy who took you know a, a religious studies class in oh, like no, freshman year at do that. liberal arts university. Don't and do they, that. You know, we're talking about how like demons in art always represent freedom, right? And I think that like that's BS. obviously demons meritless. in Milton represent freedom. That's all it is. Right. Right. Calm, but like, d- calm down, girl. There's and a history sort of, existed before Milton. Right. There's a sort of, in my mind anyway, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's a voyeuristic kind of delight in watching us fail that, that is central to the kind of the identity, the identity of demons. It's not that they, you know, want us to enjoy good things that God wags his finger and stops us from having. It's that they, they want to see us suffer and fail. And, and so, you know, some can argue as, as I often argue that like, they don't actually really give a shit about us, that they are doing it because it hurts God. Right. Like if I, have a puppy that I love and my neighbor hates me. He doesn't really give a crap about my puppy, but he's going to murder that puppy to make me hurt. Right. So, so my, that's kind of been always my conception where demons are, are, are gnash, gnashing their teeth at God and trying to get me to sin, basically just kind of screw him over. Cause he loves me so much. Then, you know, you would argue of course that they're doing it just to see us fail. And that sort of a person who uses drugs wants other people to use drugs with them kind of way, but there's certainly nothing like positive or rooting for us in any capacity mixed in there. No, yeah, no, yeah, no, no. So they just, they, they suck. Um, they want you to suck and they don't really want to hurt God. They know God can't be hurt. Um, they just, they just want to see the whole world burn. And, and that's, that's it, you know, just to, just to cause suffering for suffering's own sake. Um, Cause it turns out that once you, once you have chosen to hate the good for eternity, um, you are not a cool friend to hang around with. And that's how demons are. Um, so, yeah. So if you, so if you ever meet somebody get... who wants to like hate good for eternity, like maybe you should like not hang out with them anymore. Yeah. 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 I, there's more I could say in this and more I want to explore on this, but I, I, I want to get into the aesthetics of this because again, that definition of what demons are is so far afield from how I've ever really seen demons depicted. Um, and, and you kind of s- let me know in advance that you have sort of a breakdown of like sort of, I guess, categories of how you think demons are depicted where for me, Uh, it's Uh, more, more kind of generalized. Um, so maybe, maybe you want to take it from here and and kind of setting this up. Oh yeah. So check it out. So listen, I'm not going to pretend this is exhaustive. Um, but as a general, it's exhausting. It might be exhausting, but, um, if you want like a general rule of thumb, you know, like you're walking through a museum and you say to yourself, like, I'm on a, I'm on a date with a hot chica. And I want to seem smart. And like, we're going to go through all this Christian art. I know this is not how dates work, but I'm a priest. So be cool. Um, and uh, so you say like, I want to seem smart with how, with how demons in art work. I'm going to give you four handy categories that will help you understand on, I would say nine out of 10, maybe like 29 out of 30 cases. If you see a demon in Western art, 
it's going to it's going to fall into one of these four categories. So my four categories are inversions, perversions, Ethiopians. What? Stay with me. Okay. And hotties. Hotties. So that's it. That's what we got. Inversions, perversions, Ethiopians, and hotties. Which one do you want to start with? I kind of, I'm, I know you too well to worry that the Ethiopians part is going to be racist, but I feel like Watch my anxiety own. tells me that the Ethiopians thing might be racist. Of course it's so racist. So I feel like I need to, oh God. Of course it's racist. Oh God. Okay. Let's start with that one. I'm not, hey, listen, man, we're talking about demons here. I'm not saying like, you know, what's so amazing. Take this to prayer. It's so beautiful. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, like, if you want to know how people in Western art have depicted demons, here, my friend, are four ways that people in Western art have depicted demons. So one way, so you ask yourself, what is a demon? Well, we just talked about that for a little bit. And so you think like, well, okay, so somebody that's chosen to hate God forever. Okay. Seems bad, but like, we'll take that as given. Um, so what does that look like? Well, here's the thing. Here's lots of things. Um, one thing is that like, there are elements in the New Testament and whatever. Um, they give a pretty good sense. So like, um, let's say like, you know, who is the ruler of this world? Well, Satan is. Okay. Um, and then like, what does that mean? Well, he's like the prince of the air. And like, there's some things that are kind of complicated, a little bit hard to parse, wonderful, scary, whatever. Anyway, but then you want to think to yourself like, well, how am I going to like visually imagine that? And then, um, so let's, let's just connect a couple of dots here real quick. So a lot of basically from pretty early Christian times on, um, people drew an association between, um, the devil and everybody who doesn't believe in God. So basically, like everybody who doesn't believe in God is like under the leadership of the devil in a pretty direct way. Um, not okay. everyone, not everyone holds this, but it's it's relatively common. So um, that right. everyone it's a, it's a re reoccurring motif. Yeah. So everyone who doesn't believe like in the Christian God is ruled by Satan in a pretty direct way. Um, okay. So fine. Um, one of the ways this gets played out, um, especially in the kind of you know, from the 11th century on in Western art um, is that groups that are considered kind of visually, conceptually, politically, socially threatening um, get visually associated with demons. Um, so oh this Lord. means specifically um, Jews, Muslims, and Ethiopians. Now, I'm Great. not going to talk about yeah, I'm not going to talk about the first two. Um also Mongols cuz why not? Um no, I mean the Mongols. There's a lot of reasons why Europeans would be scared of Mongols, let's be totally honest. <laughs> um that's that's not totally that's not totally impossible to imagine. And uh but let's pause on the Ethiopians for a second because like we think I mean Ethiopia, Eritrea, you know, like we we think of this very specific geographical region, um like capital Addis Ababa, um most Ethiopians in the world lived in Addis Ababa. Uh, the second most, the second greatest concentration of Ethiopians in the entire world is Washington, D.C. Um, after that is any other city in Ethiopia other than Addis Ababa. Um, so there it is. You know, so we think that kind of thing. Um, this is not from like pre-Christian times onward. This is not what people think who live in what's now kind of like Europe and um, the Mediterranean region generally, including Northern Africa. Um, this is not what people think when they think, when they hear the word Ethiopian, um, what they think is, um, what we would call sub-Saharan African. So, um, dark black skin, various physical traits, whatever, um, sort of important for this time period is that people in like kind of very, like the Med Mediterranean Africa, um, and mm -hmm. like Mediterranean Africa and then like Mediterranean Europe. I mean, they all look the same i mean they're 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 sort of ethnically regional you know whatever you want to call it more or less the same um and uh and that their skin is dark but not um very dark you know um and so like nobody has really seen 
people from sub-Saharan Africa with very dark skin, except for like very exceptional circumstances. So in the fourth century, um, fourth and early fifth century, there is a very holy monk whose name is, and I quote, Moses the Black. And oh, he's, sure, yeah. he's known as Moses the Black because he is from sub-Saharan Africa. And so his yeah. skin is very dark black and, and nobody had seen it. They didn't know what it was, you know? And so and if like, you think, and if you think that that is an antiquated thing, uh, to refer to like a, a, a black person as just the black, and you think that wouldn't be something we would do anymore. Uh, check out Dwayne, the rock Johnson in black Adam, uh, DC comics, black Adam only in theaters. This thing. No, wait, is that, is that true? Really? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no, really? <laughs> I heard I see the trailer. He's like, I'm Black Adam. And I'm like, I can we just call him Adam? <laughs> can we, can we just, just call, call him, him Adam? Adam? Oh my gosh. Amazing. So yeah. So um so very important to imagine that from like kind of classical Greece and Rome through the Middle Ages, that word Ethiopian means sub-Saharan African. And what's important about that is not I would say not specific. Specifically, well, I would what it, rarity, rarity. Nobody has seen these people. Um, they are they're relatively rare in um, Mediterranean culture. Um, when there's when people from sub-Saharan Africa with deep black skin are seen, um, it's like a sensation, and so people mm -hmm. remember it um, for good reasons and bad reasons. I'm not apologizing for this. I'm just saying like this is a fact, you know. Um, and so, so, you know, so you have the saint Moses, the black, and like, how do you distinguish Moses, the black from the other, from the other Moses as well? He's got jet black skin. So that's what we call him. Okay. Now outside of Moses, the black, um, there's a very strong association, um, taking, and this is, I mean, this is important for Christian history. Um, it's not something we're very proud of, but like, it's just important for Christian history. Um, there is a lot of language in the Old Testament, the Psalms, et cetera, about how God being a God of light and out of darkness and that kind of stuff, which is all great, you know, whatever, totally cool, um, kind of meta metaphorical language about light and darkness, you know, fine, no problem. Um, but when you have a, you have a culture um, that has never seen people with a very, very dark skin, um, and they're very used to this language of like light and darkness in God, there is no darkness, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then you see for the first time, somebody with like jet black skin. Um, yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna be rough. And you can imagine that it, it lands sort of badly. I mean, not universally, you know, I'm not throwing the, the universe under the bus. I mean, it's just like, it just doesn't, it's easy to imagine why this doesn't end well for various circumstances especially just for kind of general yeah, conception you're a peasant in italy that's not gonna that's not necessarily gonna jive yeah yeah yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. in a positive so, way um so from pretty early on um we have or we have records from you know the fourth and the fifth century of um uh, uh from from scholars you know scholars who will talk about the devil as being um whenever you read in a medieval text a description, especially uh, before the like 13th century before um, a description of the devil, um, he will very often be, very often be described as um, an Ethiopian. Um, sometimes, sometimes he won't be like literally described as an Ethiopian. It'll be like um, a small black boy. Um, sometimes it'll be like, wow. a, yeah, yeah. So specifically like sort of a small back black boy. Um, and in various kinds of things. So um, why the smallness and the why, why like the youth and the, the particular gender um, boy because of association with just um, Antichrist basically small because okay. of because of like all of this is Antichrist. So um, uh, pretending to have Jesus, the same. It's big. So this must be small. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is this is not like. <laughs> I mean, don't, these are, these are, these are things told by people of like incredible intellectual caliber. So don't think it's totally superficial or fa or facile, but like, um, yeah, symbolism is real. I mean, this is why, this is why people get upset at the present moment about like associations between like blackness and badness is because like, you know, symbolic association is real and like it's, it's difficult it has to real take. effects. Yeah. It has real effects. And so like, 
Um, so, you know, Christ is the, is the Lord and King of all. And so you think like, well, he's like a little boy. Like the devil's like a little boy who's like pretending that he can like defeat Christ, but he's like a powerless little boy. Um, and in Christ there is no darkness. And so he's like totally black. And like, what's the only imagination of, of what's the only word that applies to somebody that's totally black? Well, he's an Ethiopian, um, et cetera. Um, wow. Does that lead to... I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure it has. Does that lead to like actual racist acts or wars or anything um, like that? Or is it just sort I of this I mean, in, the, in this thing? period, no. I mean, not, not wars, certainly, because there's just no contact. I mean, there's very, there's very, very, very little, there's very low contact. Um, uh, when, when people from sub-Saharan Africa show up in Western Europe, um, they are treated with a certain amount of sensationalism. So like there was a, um, there was a, hotel in Augsburg in Germany, um, Southern Germany, um, until a couple of years ago when they renamed it, that was called the three Moors. Um, the more, oh, you know, God. um, because, uh, because it, it was not meant as a term of, um, you know, it wasn't meant offensively. It was, it, yeah, it's just, it was just that literally in like liter- 1400 or something, li- yes, three black guys exactly. stayed here. And no, we're going to mean, this, was, this was forever. a big deal is that like in the 15th century, um, three people from sub-Saharan Africa, um, were on a long trip and passed through Augsburg and nobody knew what to make of it. It was a co- total sensation for everyone involved. And I'm not, I'm not, going to totally defend it but i'm not going to totally demonize it either like the fact is that they wanted they were so taken aback by what had happened that they wanted to name a hotel in honor of these men who had risked their own lives traveling for months and months and months and months and months from sub-saharan africa through very difficult circumstances and end up in augsburg and they like they were like you know what three black people were here once let us rename the whole hotel for that. That, that is honestly, I, mean, I think it's that actually kind of cool. The, I think it's kind of cool. Now it's vaguely been, charming. It's it's been it's, renamed now because that's that's it's you know it's a, it's a difficult it's a difficult thought. Right, but like, right, but sure. Anyway, it's a hard um, pill to swallow, but it's 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 vaguely charming and obviously way less offensive than what I was afraid you were going to say about you know like oh now we're going to target black people because they're probably the devil or something like that. So that yeah, that is no, somewhat this is, of a, we're, we're talking of a relief about, to me. Yeah, we're talking about a time period where people again like the whole reason this comes to an existence is because people. The people who are making these verbal claims will basically never have seen a black person or very, 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 very rarely, mostly by second or third mm-hmm. hand. Um, so, for instance, um, there is this amazing um, there there is this amazing passage in um, it's a it's an a passage in an illuminated manuscript um, called the Canterbury Psalter, which is from the last quarter of the, of the 12th century. So approximately 1176 to 1200 or so. Um, Why does your mic keep drooping so flaccidly? I don't know. It's very sad. Don't draw attention to it. It keeps drooping. Is there no screw on the side of your mic with which it can be affixed? I can't explain it. Anyway, so the point is... In the video um, version, it literally just keeps drooping like Charlie Brown walking home from the Christmas pageant. It's hilarious. So, okay. So, um, okay. It's all great. Imagine that it's like say 1190 and you're living in England and you say like, what? So you read Matthew 8, 28 to 32, where Christ drives out the Gadarene demoniacs. Mm -hmm. Um, And you say to yourself, what does that exactly look like? Well, let me tell you In in the Canterbury Psalter, what does the devil look like? Well, oh, God, he's a bunch of Ethiopians. So oh, now what's, no. what's really striking about this, about this particular piece of art um, is that, okay, so this I would say is relatively normal for this period in the Middle Ages, um, which is that the demons who are being cast out of the demoniacs are, um, they're kind of jet black imps, imps, you know, so like. Yeah, jet black imps kind of um they have recognizable features which are clearly I would say racist caricatures of sub-Saharan Africans. Um but they're but they're kind of imps, you know, that's that's a that's a pretty old trope. Mm-hmm. Um okay. So again, I'm not 
I'm not defending this, but I'm just saying like that's that's how it is. Um, what's super unusual though is that the demoniacs themselves are represented as black people. Um, so like their 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 skin is for somebody who's never seen a black person, their skin is you know skin of black people. Um, for somebody who's never seen a black person, their you know physical features are kind of exaggerated caricature of. Um, certain stereotypes of black people again they've never seen one so um, right it's kind of like the contemporary drawings of an elephant you know i mean you've, you've never seen one so you just make it make it work um yeah it's a it's um, a, our artistic game of telephone yeah exactly right so that's kind of that's kind of what's happening um but that's super it's super interesting because the demoniacs themselves are represented as ethiopians on the strength of of the demons that were possessing them who have now been cast out um being so strongly associated with ethiopians that even people that they possessed are visually associated with demo with with ethiopians um that's it that's exceptional i mean this particular example is exceptional um and if you're watching it on youtubes um you can see it because it's really it's really worth seeing honestly it's a, it's a it's a fascinating visual image um but the but the visual association of demons with um black skin if they're represented more in a more human like way with um physical features that are certain kind of stereotyped caricatures of sub-saharan africans um that's a thing you know i mean and that's and i i, I wanted to bring that up because like it's important yeah, i mean we can't I mean, shy have, away from I it have, it's an I important have, aspect of the yeah, of the, of the tradition have, yeah i have lots to say about um about the way that that demons are represented in Christian art, um, but this is something that's important to recognize, which is that like um, we're recognizing that there's a certain amount of kind of like I mean a literal demonizing of like what we call like the other. You know, there's a literal demonizing of the other things that are foreign, things that are totally strange, things that are totally alien, um, and so you can see these things like there are there are representations of demons that have you know stereotyped characters of Jewish features um, in a in a really unattractive and and you know um kind of awful way um there are representations of demons in christian art that have um you know uh, sort of are clearly taking off of stereotype muslim features and you know muslim um garb and these kinds of things mm -hmm. um and that's just how it is you know so one one it's not it's not all there is and it's not actually the most important it's 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 relatively speaking it's uh, i would say this is the smallest of the of the branches that we're going to talk about today um but it's real it's real, and um, and I think we have to just embrace. I mean, we have to acknowledge it and see it for what it is. That like when we're talking about demons, because of what we're talking about theologically, their place in understanding who God is and what it would mean mm -hmm. to say no to God. That um, there is a lot of unfortunately, there's a lot of room here for mapping one's own cultural sense of what it means to reject the good. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a real temptation to just map that straightforwardly onto what a demon looks like or what a demon is like. Sure. Um, and one of those legacies that I, is frankly relevant even for our contemporary moment is that um, there uh, there is a strain of Christian representation in art of demons as Jews, Muslims, and especially Ethiopians. Yeah, and it would be sweeping it under the rug not to recognize it and to learn from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just there yeah. it is, you know. Ooh. Well, I don't like that one bit, but well, you're not supposed as to like demons. As long as it's the worst thing we, I guess. What can well, I say? That's fair. That's what can fair. I say? Yeah. This conversation was always going to be awkward and 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 evil, demonic even. I mean, but you have three other categories. I do have three other categories. Which one do you want? Inversions, perversions, or hotties? Uh, I want to end most with time. We want to end with hotties. hotties. We got to yeah. end with hotties. So can I just talk yeah, about inversions real quick? Finale. Okay. Yeah, so the real quick with, with, with inversions. So the deal with inversions, what I mean by inversions yeah, is that run it. I'm, yeah. I'm going to speed run it. Calm down. I'm going to speed run when I want to <laughs> speed run. So what I mean by inversions though, is that the point again, because I said, we said at the beginning that like, what is it? What is an, what is a demon? A demon is a fallen angel, right? So is a demon so a demon is created as an angel, all beautiful, all good, in love with God from the beginning, and then says, like, you know what, F that. Like, I don't really need it. Like, I would prefer to kind of do my own thing. 
screw you, dad, I'm going home. Okay, so um, one important way of depicting demons in Christian history um, is as, I would say, like an inversion of angelic beauty. Like and okay. in, So think about the way that angels are depicted. And my friends, if you think to yourself, how are angels depicted in Christian art? I don't know how to say this, but we have three hours of content for you to listen to. It's called <laughs> Angels 1 and Angels 2. So listen to that. And then I put this, put this thing on pause, come back, listen to that. It'll be great. Um, but in the meantime, so it's going to be like a, like a, an, an, an inversion of that. So, um, Starting in about the 11th century in Western art, um, the most common markers for a demon are going to be um, horns, horns. Okay, great. Um, a tail, woo, tails, um, and wings. Okay, um, like weird wings, you know. So like angels will have like butterfly wings if you're for Angelico, um, or they'll have like bird wings if you're most mm -hmm. people. Um, but like demons are going to have like bat wings. Sure. Yeah. You know, scary stuff. Scary. Like they're going to have horns um they're going to be like totally covered in hair like fur you know because like that's weird um i mean listen people from some countries that's normal okay don't get weird all right but like listen what i'm saying that's not getting is, a more offensive stereotype that's right it's just there it is um and then like and the, the thing is they're also usually depicted nude or or almost nude um and that's for various reasons like one is because like you know nudity is associated with um barbarism you know um it's barbarous to be naked um it's civilized to be clothed um one is a certain association with sin um kind of to do with the first one and um but the most important in the end is, is because it shows off their physical deformities. Because so, so if, um, you know, if a demon is like creepy and scary and a weird version of an angel, but is wearing like a long robe, it's going to be like, bro, do you have like a weird wolf chest <laughs> under that robe? Because I can't really see it, you know, so they so they depict them naked, you know, or mostly naked. But that's um, that's a hard. I'm going to be honest. This is a hard sell for me because. This this is obviously besides the haughty one, and I, I don't know what you mean by the next category. But the the besides the haughty one, this is obviously the the, the form of demon or the depiction of demons that I'm most familiar with, and it's can it's always been can well not confusing to me, but it's at least raised an eyebrow because you know these are supposed to be these foul kind of predatory creatures, but they by and large are depicted with the features of prey animals. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're talking mm -hmm. about cloven hooves. We're talking about, you know, goat horns. We're talking about, you know, deer, goats, sheep, antelope. Mm -hmm. These kinds of creatures are being largely sourced. I don't know where the forked tail thing comes from because I've never seen a forked tail anywhere near in, in nature at all. Um, but but besides that, it's it's always kind of goat stuff. And I mean, the predominant theory I've heard when I've tried to research it is um that it harkens back to a lot of these artists trying to kind of mimic what they were seeing in depictions of, of pan in, in Greek mythology, that the pan is this you know, of kind of seductive mm -hmm. figure. I also kind of inferred that, you know, Christ has this motif where he talks about uh, sheep, uh, you know, the Christian, you know, the, his children being sheep, he is the good shepherd. And then, right. and then goats are, uh, you know, those who refuse to listen to him. Of course, you know, I, I, I always kind of struggled with that too, because I was like, well, what if you're born a goat? Do you just not? But then of course I met a guy in college who actually had worked on a sheep farm and he talked about how uh, sheep can be trained to listen to the sound of the shepherd's voice, but goats can't and they'll just scatter if you call. So there's sort of an illusion <laughs> being made to you know, yeah, sheep yeah. listen and goats don't listen. So I always sort of inferred, okay, well maybe the demons are goatish because of that scripture, but still, you know, when you're talking about a, you're you're proposing, oh well, this is the opposite of an angel. When I think the opposite of wings, I think fins, right? When I think the you know the opposite of um, being in heaven, I think under the ground. So if I'm if I'm just trying to draw a demon based on being the opposite of angel, I'm going to draw like a finned mole man. I'm not going to draw a little goat guy with with you know uh, forked tail that doesn't even exist in nature. Explain how you can justify your argument to me. Yeah. So if you've never seen a dolphin pretty much go with what you're thinking um but like but yeah pretty much pretty much go with what you're thinking um so just like think of an inversion 
of an angel you've never seen really much in the way of marine life um in terms of like whales dolphins whatever um so yeah so rather than thinking of like fins you think of bat wings and you think of like um well what's the opposite what's the opposite of something that's like beautiful and covered in feathers well some like horrible monster thing that lives in the deep that's covered in like gross ass fur so yeah that's cool you know we'll do that um so the, like the specific kind of goatee stuff that's kind of late or whatever um so um so here's a here's a pretty boss example um is um uh, so this is this is this pretty awesome piece of art from the 15th century um, called the Madonna del Socorso, the Madonna of um, of the Our Lady of Refuge. Uh, we call it in mm-hmm. English. Um, it's a, it's an Italian piece of work um, by an unknown author known as the the Master of the Nativity. Um, it's so boss because on the right hand side of the image you see there's this devil. And the devil is very clearly an inverted angel because he's standing up. He's kind of small for the figures in the painting. He's, I think he's the smallest figure in the, figure in the painting. Um, he's got bat dragon wings. So again, not like cool butterfly wings, not pretty bird wings, but like gross ass bat wings because bat wings are gross. Everyone would have seen a bat. Bats are gross. Fine. You know? Um, sure. Um, angels are like, they have like, pretty skin or like feathers or things that are pretty and like you know this demon's covered in like red fur and like i mean i'm covered in red fur but like i'm not saying it's the most attractive thing on the planet so like um (laughs) it's like gross right and like he's got a snake wrapped around one arm which i'm just going to tell you right now if you if you are going through life with a snake wrapped around one arm because you think like chick's going to dig you they're not no, not, it's a bad not, life choice. They're not, and they're not going to dig you. It's bad. So, I mean, it's obviously Eden, right? Like, he's the devil, and this is a snake wrapped around his arm. He's the snake. You know, he's the devil who's tempting people in Eden. So, fine. You know, it's all cool visually. Um, he's got something between his legs. It's a little bit hard to tell whether it's a tail or a penis um, that's sort of, like, warped and twisty. It's it's long. It kind of it twists down between his legs. With with devils in, in art. I, it's I relate often, to that a lot. I yeah, yeah, fair lot. enough. Yeah, weird knobs. Yeah. It's pretty much normal. Mm-hmm. Nothing to worry about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it's often hard to tell, to be honest, whether it's, like, a tail or a penis or whatever. It's just it's some warped kind of monstrous thing. Yeah. Um, and like, okay, fine, there it is. Um, but it's but the image is so so the so the the devil is it's clearly depicted as like Satan, whatever. It's got you know like fangs coming out of his bottom of his mouth. Um, uh, it's like scary if you look at it on its own. It's kind of scary. But like the center, so and then there are also these two little kids, like a girl and a boy, who are like running away from this like scary devil thing. And like they're they're mm-hmm. obviously little kids, but they're about the same size as the devil is. And they're running towards the center of the image, which is this relative, the demon, the kids, gigantic Blessed Virgin Mary. And you think like, oh, that's cool. Cause like Our Lady of Our Lady of Good of Sucker, you know, like Our, Our Lady of Refuge, like that's cool. Cause like you, you run to Our Lady and Refuge from the Devil. Like, yeah, true, true, true. That's the point. Very cool. And there's nothing exactly saccharine about this image because our lady is holding a big ass club over her head that she is like about God. to hit the devil with. Nice. And it's so freaking amazing. So when I say inversion, this is the kind of thing I mean is that like, think of everything that um, early centuries would have used to represent demons. And then you invert that. But then or again, angels, because similar. like, for, excuse me would you used to represent angels then you invert that and then you get demons um but in the end like christians have this actually pretty blase opinion about demons i mean they know they exist but like they're not going to be totally panicked about them and so like right um you're a christian you're scared of devils it's like oh my gosh i'm scared of the devil omg uh and like i run towards like mama mary who is just like a big house frau with like a freaking big ass club that she's going to use to beat the devil away you're just like can't argue with that i can't argue with that i still don't really understand where the forked tail thing comes from but are you in are you implying that when i see forked tails on modern demons that that's a misunderstanding that in these things that's just their long skinny penis um i'm just not sure that i've seen that a ton 
in older depictions. Um, so you that think might, that's a more modern thing. I let me back that up. I am sure I have not seen that very much, if at all, in older depictions. So like where the forked tail i would assume that would come from transference from the forked tongue which is going to be oh, snake associated from eden um sure. now there is a really wild story where is this story it's so clear in my mind but where is the story there's a really wild story of somebody oh in dante of course in dante um <laughs> who's um penis turns into like splits into two it's really explicit. Um, his penis splits into two and it becomes <laughs> like the legs, I think, of a lizard. And then his whole body becomes a lizard. Um, Again, the, relatable. Deeply relatable. Relatable. We've all been there. Now, he's in hell. So, you know, that, that, that shit's going to last forever. But there it is. Um, uh, yeah. But no. But basically, like, I think the fork tail thing, I would say, is probably phallic transfer from the fork tongue of the snake. So hmm. interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. We got goats. We got penises. We got racism. We so got far, Ethiopians, it's a party. We got inversions. Yeah. So far, what I'm hearing you say is that basically demons are great. Nothing to worry about. No risk of getting canceled here. Yeah. I have no discomfort with airing this episode. I'm not quietly thinking to myself that maybe we should bury it and never let it be seen anywhere. Yeah. Cool. I'm with you. Seems great. great. You want to talk about great. perversions? Sure. Yeah, I can't see how with it. I can't see how that would make this conversation worse. Yeah, the best part is this could not possibly get any worse. So let's talk about perversions. Um, so we talk about Ethiopians. All right, we we know what's going on there. Inversions. All right. Perversions are basically that. Like it's again, it's it's following on the same or similar logic, which is that. So God makes everything good. And anything that isn't good is a corruption of something that was supposed to be good. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're talking about a demon, what you're talking about is something that was supposed to be good, but has been corrupted away from its proper nature and it's corrupted in such a way that it can never become uncorrupted um mm -hmm. and one way of talking about that say this been perverted so it's been it's been perverted um so um there are a lot of depictions of um demons specifically as perverted so like good things that have been perverted like permanently and in or in erratically corrupted so okay. um you know my favorite Probably my favorite, well, one of my favorite artists, period, actually, um, is Hieronymus Bosch, who's from the lowlands in the beginning of the 16th century. Um, and he paints this painting, um, this one particular painting, only paints a number of paintings, they're all great, um, that's known as the Garden of Earthly Delights between like 1503 and 1515. Yeah, we literally um, talked about this in our very first episode because it's so weird. And uh, we wanted to kind of set the tone for the rest of the series. Yeah, it's true. And I love it so much. It's so amazing. I love it a thousand percent. And so um, I got to see it in person in January. It was amazing. Anyway, um, oh, awesome. yeah, it's in Madrid. And um, because the king of Spain, you know, it's fine. And sure. um, anyway, so the point is the middle, the middle part of the triptych is like kind of weird things that are happening in a world that is neither heaven nor hell. Don't ask. Just move on. Um, the left wing of the triptych is like heaven eden heaven all the all the above the right wing of the triptych is obviously hell um and there's all kinds of super fascinating and weird things that are happening in um on the hell wing of the triptych um but one thing that's really cool as a kind of ongoing reality about Bosch's theological vision is that he has a really, really, really deep understanding that evil is a perverted goodness. Mm -hmm. So evil is not, which is, which is to say evil is not created on its own. Evil is not created for its own sake. Evil is um, a corruption of something that's supposed to be good. So something is made good and then like by its own choice decides to become evil. And then like, that's that. You know, so mm -hmm. um, 
so the hell part of um, Hieronymus Bosch's vision of what hell is like is all of these super duper wild, really crazy, really, really, really crazy um, parodies of God's creation. So like, you know, read through the chapter Genesis chapter one, Genesis chapter two. And like every time that God says like, and it, and God saw, and it was good. What if God saw, and it was actually like kind of bad. What if it was actually shitty? Yeah. God saw and was like, wow, actually gross ass. Maybe no, thank you. Well, that's like the kind of thing that populates hell in Hieronymus Bosch's, Bosch's vision. So, um, so, for instance, um, there's this really cool, really cool, I mean, creepy, weird um, uh, vision from Hieronymus Bosch of like, you think what's best in the world? Well, if you're a faithful believing Christian in like the very, very, very beginning of the 16th century and you say like, well, what's like best in the world. Um, you might say cheese. cheese or religious, actually like Catholic oh, religious, yeah, okay. um, you right, know, sure. among who, who, eat, who eat a lot of cheese, who eat a lot of cheese, be Make honest. A lot of cheese. Um, all the, all the above and beer. Um, and so there are these, there's this weird recurring, I mean, eerie, like weird with a Y, if you want to be like very terry passionate about it. Um, thing about these um like recurring pattern in Hieronymus Bosch's vision of hell of um the demons in hell being like a perverted religious order oh so there's these really wild wild passages where like demons are not I mean he has images of demons that are kind of like you know monsters with hooks and scary flesh tearing and eating kind of things but like not all of them are and what some of the ones that aren't that are kind of more mentally captivating for us in a certain way are um yeah they look like um they're wearing habits they look like monks mm-hmm. the only way you can tell that they're not monks is that they're like sitting on the souls of the damned maybe torturing them and to be clear they, you are not currently sitting on a soul of a of the damned you're sitting on a, on a chair of some kind as far of as far as i know yes as far as last i know time you checked that's okay. my check yes um and like they have weird proboscis as far as i know <laughs> i don't i don't have a weird proboscis i mean i have a nose that's very italian but like it's not a weird proboscis you know and yeah, um, they they look like uh is that what they're called proboscis monkeys that have like the huge yeah floppy squidward nose they always yeah. they do look very squidwardy yeah, yeah yeah that's 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 kind of how he works um which i think is really kind of wonderful because like you look at this conception of the devil of like a demon you know in hell torturing damned souls and whatever and you're like you know it's not very something it's not something that's normally like very edifying you know like oh what an amazing thing you know um but I think this kind of is actually because like you realize actually the only way that you get to the vision of like a member of a religious order, like torturing lost souls is that you think that like a religious order is actually one of the greatest gifts that God gave to the human being, you know, um, mm-hmm. that you think these are actually like one of the signs of the perfection that comes from the cross is like men and women who want to live like in vowed celibacy, who want to live in poverty, who want to live in obedience, who want to live in like counter distinction to like the pride of the devil and like the wealth of the devil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Um, but then you think, well, what would that look like as perverted? And well, as perverted, it would look like um, like a weird monster demon religious order with like a weird proboscis and like maybe squid face and um, yeah, look like look like Squidward is a monk. Uh huh. I can get down with that. That's this is the first one I can get down with. Yeah, I feel like that's pretty that's pretty normal. Um, I uh, there is another super great passage from the same painting. Um, which I would really hardly recommend to anybody um, who has eyes, Um, (laughs) which is, so there's this guy 
who's naked of course he's a damn soul just be cool um they took his clothes it doesn't matter and um he's seated he has on his lap um a manuscript of an indulgence so you know it's supposed to be like a quote unquote like a get out of hell free card Mm -hmm. so he has on on his lap a manuscript of an indulgence which is clearly not doing anybody any good um and he is kind of like pulling his face away because um someone is attempting to kiss him very passionately and that someone is a pig dressed as a nun oh no i'm gonna tell you right now if you ever like come to yourself one morning and there's a pig you're naked and there's a pig dressed as a nun trying to kiss you my friend this is the sign that you were looking for that you need to change your life. Yeah, you you have made some choices. You have made some choices that you should unmake. I'm telling you that right now. Um, Yeesh. Uh, but I but I think this is also really great, you know, because like again, it's a parody of because what's evil is a perversion of what's good. So like even the indulgence, which you know, Bosch is making up a polemical statement here about the way mm-hmm. that indulgences are being abused. Um, P.S. You know, hashtag. Luther, um, somebody named Martin Luther in not very many years hence will find that like there's such an abuse of indulgences that he will maybe think that like the whole church should be done with. So there are some problems here, you know, and so Hieronymus is making a a strong and polemical point um, that this too, not in itself, but in the way that is being practiced where he lives um, is a perversion of the goodness of God. And there's also like kind of demonic. Um, And again, like how does he represent it? Well, he represents it by like, not just a monster, but like a woman who is made to be beautiful um, with, who is made to have a dignity of her own, et cetera, et cetera. And he makes, and then you think of a nun who is meant to be like a chaste spouse of Christ with a, with a beauty and dignity of her own. Um, and then he depicts this kind of ugliness and crassness, the crassness of, he- of hell, the crassness, yeah. you know? Uh-huh. Um, not like sexy Milton demon or whatever, but like the crass, nasty, unattractive, like garbage of hell. Uh-huh. He depicts as like, yeah, it's a pig. Dressed like a nun. <laughs> friggin deal with it you know yeah it's like it's so simple but it is inventive and i kind of love it yeah you want that to be sexy let me give you sexy i'll give you sexy demon it's a pig dresses a nun yeah. friggin deal with it i mean for some do people. you think my friends do you think that you have made a personal deal with god where like you've got your way to live and God's got his way to live and like you're going to freaking deal with it and he's going to deal with it. If you think that, I counter propose to you this man with a writ of indulgence on his lap being aggressively, unwelcomely sexually aggressed by a pig dressed as a nun. Yikes. Yeah. I should have known we were going to get in some really freaking weird territory. I don't know why I was so brutally unprepared for this. Yeah. If it makes you feel any better there, we have weirder places to go, but I feel like, do you, we're talking about perversions. We're talking about things that God made to be good. I feel like you probably have some thoughts here. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I appreciate you, you, you serving, <laughs> serving up on a platter for me, but I, yeah, no, I mean, I think this is, this is an interesting motif, right? Because I, I work with people a lot who think that, I mean, I think that the, the, the general conception, right? is just that bad things are bad things and that bad things exist for themselves, right? I did a bad thing, right? But this just kind of isn't the case, right? That, that ultimately, um, bad things are, as you keep saying, like a, a twist on, on what is, is true, good and beautiful. So like a really good example of this that drives me flipping crazy is like, um, 
like I'll have a client come to me sometimes and they will uh, say, you know, oh, you know, here's my problem, blah, 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 blah. But am I just being selfish or am I just being prideful? And like, this is kind of an overall, um, this is like a thing I hear often, even with like non-religious clients, right? This is like a very common, well, maybe I'm just being selfish. And it's weird because when it comes to morality, people do that, right? They, if they can name it a, an evil thing, if they can name it as a sin, if they can label it as a sin, then they just sort of stop short and they don't need to investigate it any further. As though saying, the reason I'm doing this thing in my life isn't because I'm depressed or anxious. It's because I'm selfish. Yeah, because I'm though, evil. Yeah, because I'm bad. Well, but as though the answer to that would then be to just what? Like, try harder, right? But but my be point less is always- evil. Right. Right, exactly. Like, like, what are you supposed to do with that label and with that information, right? And, and my point is always, you know- go deeper than that right like okay let's say you are being prideful but my question is why let's say you are being selfish but what's the core thing behind that right and most often it is it is some true good and beautiful desire that has been through woundedness or through cruelty or whatever twisted right and so we call that pride or we call that selfishness we call that lust or we call that whatever we call that but it's it's problematic to me that we've that that kind of the common place conversations about morality always sort of end with oh the bad thing is just a bad thing by itself and we're not going to go any deeper than that and so i think this conception of no no bad things are just twists of good things so let's figure out what the good thing is at the center of this so that we can untwist it and find a healthier and more effective way for you to get your need met right because this is the other thing about evil right is that ultimately it is incredibly dissatisfying and it doesn't actually fulfill your need it just right you know temporary numbs it temporarily numbs it right so let, let's find a more effective means of meeting your need by untwisting the evil to find what what good is there and you know is is a is a pig nun like the most self-explanatory depiction of that reality maybe maybe not but it is certainly one of the more visceral that i can imagine and and i like it for that reason because I, I i do think that it's important that we start with that premise of evil as just the inversion of good otherwise we do end up not knowing what to do with evil it, we just say right. well i guess i'll try harder and it becomes very well, flaccid not unlike yeah, your I microphone guess, i guess evil is just evil there it is and i just try to like not love it so much i guess yeah, it's just wild it's, it's like, like like oh you know i'm a bad parent okay you're a bad parent why well i think it's because you have depression that's going untreated okay great and well what if i'm actually just selfish and you know prideful well what if that like you know like what are you supposed to do with that information i'm not saying that you're not right. being selfish and prideful you almost certainly are but my question is what does that even mean and what do we do with that information and i think right if we start off with the definition of evil as a thing that exists for itself the answer is nothing but if we start off with you're the screwed, example yeah yeah you're just screwed just try harder i guess to not do that thing but if we start off with the definite definition of evil as the inversion of good there's an immediate roadmap laid out for us in in the moral and the mental health life which i, I find personally helpful so right yeah, yeah yeah no i i agree completely um and there is um there is a really cool i would say like additional mode of the like perversion representation mm -hmm. of demons in um in christian art that i think is super awesome um and um there is a specific example that I, I'd like to give from um, he's a guy called he's we only know him as the master of Belmonte from like about the latter half of the 15th century in Spain. Mm -hmm. um, he has this amazing depiction of St. Michael um, trampling a demon, right? So this is the trope is like St. Michael trampling a demon. Okay, fine. Um, but the devil whom he is like trampling is really distinctly depicted so um you look at him and he is made of like a thousand different components so Ooh. like his left upper arm is sort of made of like a lizard insect monster that mm -hmm. attaches to his shoulder by like biting onto it. Oh, fun. 
and his left like forearm is like a weird skeleton fangy clingy kind of thing so you like got this, a like, chimera weird transformer of sorts skeleton bony kind of thing and then it turns into like a lizard snake thing that attaches to satan's like shoulder by biting onto it you mm-hmm. know and then like his thighs are like dogs basically like kind of like dog faces so they're kind of coming out of his out of his um waist basically as like Uh dog heads and so that means they're kind of like gnawing his own knees and his knees are then like it it is kind of like chicken leg kind of bony sticky um skeletony things with like chicken feet kind of things um so like weird sort of monsters um he's got this weird kind of skull face which is kind of fascinating but then um his chest is a face like a weird scary face and then his groin is another like weird scary face um and basically what's happening here is that all of the capital vices are depicted as present on satan's body and oh cool consuming himself That's right awesome. so it's so it's not like oh my gosh satan is so free he can just like eat whatever he wants and like screw whoever he wants and like be proud and just like do his hair however he wants and whatever it's like satan bears in his own person all of the vices and the evil in the world and there can be no harmony there because harmony is the thing of christ Mm -hmm. and so all the vices in the world literally eat themselves on his flesh so like gluttony devours his stomach lust is his groin like dogs eat his legs you know like it goes on and on and on I love and that like kind of self-sabotaging yeah depiction of evil i think like, that's a really fun that like he literally doesn't have an arm other than the fact that his own arm is eating his shoulder that's metal it's like super metal metal, man and like and i think this is so great this is so great because again like this is not evil as like a oh my gosh like so misunderstood so like whatever this is like actually evil the thing about evil is that it sucks. Right. Yeah. It yeah, it hurts people. It hurts, it hurts the people you. doing it. It hurts the people who do it and then it hurts the people who receive it and all the rest and all the rest and all the rest, you know. And like um there is this about depictions of um demons in Christian art is that while there are real um dark sides to the way in which um this kind of sub- corruption of the of, of goodness can be imagined like we saw with specific, specifically like the ethiopians jews muslims which is very a very dark period a very dark kind of shadow in the imagination of um christians about thinking about what a kind of rejection of god can look like um there are also things about this imagination that can be i think very profoundly fascinating profoundly fruitful and even life-giving um and this is one of them you know because um thinking about how to visualize a demon who is fundamentally immaterial you know, this is the thing about demons is that they find they don't actually have bodies so any way mm-hmm. of visually representing them is kind of inventing a body for them mm-hmm. um so christian artists they use them in part as a way of kind of working out their own in part inventiveness frankly about like what could it look like to be eternally at war with yourself oh sure yeah Mm -hmm. you know um and then like also you think about like what what would it be like to be you know a perverted version of an animal a perverted version of a human a perverted version of God, Mm -hmm. you know, and you kind of like imagine all of that together. So you think of, in a way, you have to think of everything that you love the most. And then think like, what would it, what could it possibly look like 
to be ruined and spoiled. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that. I, th- I love yeah. that as a starting creative prompt. I think that's that's really compelling. Yeah. So I could I could obviously talk about this forever, but I think that's probably enough about perversions. I think you're a therapist. Can, uh, There's never enough about perversions. Come on, be honest. <laughs> I I I want to get to why we all really came here. You've made me suffer through racism. Hey, it's You've... Ethiopians as devils. It's complicated. It's not that complicated. It's racist. Fact, yeah, um, true. You've made mm-hmm. me suffer through perversions. Mm-hmm. Inversions. Um, don't forget inversions. Yeah. Well, Those are the weird inversions too. thing. What you made me suffer through was was that de- little Muppet demon tails are actually like misunderstood peni. They could be. So that's awful. I want to say I it's an that. open open your heart. It could be. That's all I'm saying. I don't want to open my heart to to demons. You're the one who wanted to talk about demons and art, dude. It's not my fault. (laughs) God. Okay. So I've hated every ounce of this conversation, which means that I want to get to the thing we all came for, which is the hotties. Hotties. How did this happen? Because this this part, I pulled up a couple of my favorite examples. You've been throwing out all this art. I haven't gotten a say one ding dang painting. This whole episode. We've just been talking about your favorite yeah, paintings and arts. Thank girl. Um, but like Fallen Angel, Alexander Caban in 1847. Mm. Uh, very sexy demon, big black, uh, feathery wings. Um, not the not the not the um, you know, bat wings at all. Like little powder blue in there. Ooh. Jacked as all of hell. Of course he is, yeah. Uh uh you know there's more modern stuff like roberto ferry in like the 70s um uh denying satan so christ denying satan by carl block i think is oh how you yeah the yeah uh-huh. that's the yeah, famous one yeah, but yeah like mm-hmm. you know here's jesus you know like sh- stretching out his hand and then just like a very sexy devil kind of draped uh in red running away from jesus like not being tempting at all but still just so sexy just so and then and so, and so it just naked, goes on and so on and sexy on. And that's before we even that's before we can get into like tv and book stuff like lucifer uh you know neil gaiman's lucifer on netflix Your favorite. Or, or um my least favorite uh, or or as you already referenced milton and the sort of like sultry sauntering satan that that everyone's so accustomed to this is my least favorite depiction of devils because i recognize or at least i assume that the whole point of this is demons are supposed to tempt you uh therefore we're going to make them sexy because that's tempting but i think that's such a reductionistic view of like what temptation actually is at a core level and i think it's probably contributed pretty severely to this really problematic idea that you know ultimately all sin is is sexy it's so great but like god is so square and and he he kind of sucks and he wants you to not do it for reasons that are weird and the idea that the church is obsessed with sex and like a hundred other really problematic ideas i think all stem from like hmm we should we should depict temptation this way now i remember from our angels episode that a lot of this is because renaissance artists and and baroque artists and all these guys were just kind of obsessed with trying to depict the human form Mm -hmm. and and, you know go back to kind of a a, you know neo greco-roman thing in their art and so this gave them an excuse to do that but gal darn has it backfired am i missing anything in my assessment of why these things are so ding dang sexy um no i'm so glad you brought up alexander cabanel's fallen angel though because i love it so much better pronunciation than it doesn't matter that's the same thing um is that i love it i love that painting so much because it's just like okay scene like pov you're god and like you have been yelling through teenage satan's door for an hour telling him that he needs to clean up his room you finally force the lock and open the door and there is naked satan teenager pouting hunky kind of pouting kind of covering his eyes kind of just like i hate you dad and like Okay. I mean, honestly, if this wasn't called 
what it's if called if it wasn't titled what it's titled i would not know that was satan yeah well i mean like there's he's nothing kinda, to show he's me kind that of at all and he has red hair and like bad people have red hair which is fair um <laughs> you're like i will you're like <laughs> i will argue you know i will i will fight back with the medievalists who thought that black people were the devil they were racist and wrong but the people who think gingers are the devil as a ginger you can say that's true. technically speaking i'm a i'm a beard ginger which is a rare species um we have souls i've never seen you with hair so i don't know that yeah that's true. no you you don't but it's true i am and um and and it's a it's a rare species we have souls it's complicated anyway um the point is so yeah um so there is this weird thing we talked about various versions of like how when you like talk to a Christian from like any time period and you, you just like grab them and be like, here is a piece of paper and or parchment and or papyrus and like a charcoal or a quill or a pencil or whatever. And like, quick, quick, what does the devil look like? You know, and they're like, well, he probably looks like an Ethiopian or he probably looks like a furry angel thing. With bat wings because bats are gross. Or like, um, I once saw a decomposing animal and I think he probably looks like that. But then come like 1600, you're like, quick, draw me, quick, real quick. What does the devil look like? And it's like, sexy, hunky, naked boy, man, dude with a scowl and red hair. And you're just like, okay, oh, I feel... Call me crazy, but I feel like something has changed. Um, yeah. Yeah. And something has dramatically something shifted, has and not for the better. Shifted for the weird. What is happening in the House of Commons? What would you say yeah. is happening here? Um, so you are right that, like, historically speaking, basically. Um, so, you know, this there was this amazing movie from the 1990s called. Um, based on a book called how Stella got her groove back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, love it because classic work of American. Yeah. Fiction. And because I was not like a middle-aged divorcee in the 1990s, I've never read it or seen it. Um, but, uh, but I know what it's about. Um, and basically the history of the depiction of the devil in art, it could really be like subtitled, like colon, how satan got his groove back um <laughs> because that's really what happened is that like comes the renaissance like putting it very loosely but like comes the renaissance like comes on the renaissance that's disgusting gross. so like scene it's 1500 um you know your god you've been yelling at satan for a while and then you like break down the door and like previously every time you knocked on the door he'd been this like gross like monster demon thing and then suddenly you open up the door and he's this like naked sulky like hunky naked dude with like red hair you're like what that you're like oh i've gone in the wrong room i'm <laughs> you I'm know sorry. what put on some damn clothes and satan is like i don't want to you're not my dad no you're like i no. you're the worst make you're me. the yeah, exactly you're the worst and listen i don't want to simplify it but that is literally what happens i mean not satan not like god knocking on satan's door but like but yeah, basically, like literally what happens is that like the Renaissance is so obsessed with the human form and so obsessed with like the beauty of the human form um, that they really won't tolerate ugliness in the human form in pretty much any respect. And so basically, like even Satan has got to be like super, super sexy. Um, so even Satan has got to get his sexy on. Um, there are exceptions. Um, uh, Rembrandt. No, not Rembrandt. Excuse me. Um Boop, 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 boop. There's some famous painter whose name I'm blanking on right now who has a, who has a famous painting of um, who's really good at depicting the human form who has a kind of Michael depict like casting Satan and all into into hell and it's like it's all naked human for me but like the the angels are kind of gross you know because they're like whatever mm -hmm. but like but no basically literally that is what happens so like imagine in in visual art, you have this total obsession with the human form. That means that, like, it just has to be beautiful at, at, at all costs, you know? Um, then you've got, mm. like, Milton, you know, whose influence shouldn't be neglected here because because Milton's basic effect is, like, what if, like, God was just, like, a bad dad and the angels were amazing 
you know, and it's like, wow. Right. Yeah. Hey, Neil Gaiman, I thought you were Which like, is exactly original, but like, again, it turns out you're not. Yeah, no. Right. But, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that basically creates like all angelic and Christian Judeo Christian fan fiction forever, for ever since ever yeah, for like the last, yeah, ever arguably since. 500 years. Yeah. Um, until the last four when a new tradition emerges, but we will get to that. In okay. A yeah. Which I'm curious about actually, but, um, but yeah, so like, so basically you get a lot of stuff. So, um, from a faithful Christian perspective, like one way of representing this, for instance, is, um, the ever famous, um, last judgment from the Sistine Chapel from Michelangelo. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah. that's after this period where like, you know, you want to pick something good, Make it a sexy, naked human body, preferably a man's body, because men are sexy and ladies are whatever. Uh, and then, like, uh, if it makes anything bad, well, probably also still a sexy, naked man's body. Keep, there it is. Um, so, you know, Susan Chapel, 1530s, 1540s. All right, fine. Um, but there's a real change there with the depiction of demons because um, they're, they really look, at this point, basically the same as the fallen, fallen souls. Um they have slight differences. Sure, there's no differentiation. Yeah, yeah. they have slight differences. Um, so, uh, like for instance, um, uh, like they, um, this is this this is famous excerpt from it um, where there's this like naked damn soul who's like kind of cowering, covering his face, and then this like scary demon is like wrapped around his legs and it's like pulling him down into hell. But if you look at the yeah. but if you mm-hmm. look at the two of them, they're they're intentionally kind of like mirror images of each other. And the scary demon is pulling him into hell. It's just he's a he's also a sexy naked dude, but he he has like little horns, you know? Um very little horns. Very little, like very little, yeah. Like extremely little yeah. body augmentation yeah, yeah. tumbler yeah. horns. Toast, yeah, yeah, toast, toast, toast. Um But there is something about that which is interesting from the in the hands of somebody who has like an immense respect for the human form um and the immense Mm -hmm. respect for the dignity of the human form and it's eschatological at the end of time in heaven destiny you know like michelangelo sure which is like it's a kind of um i think it's a certain richer vision of what we saw in the earlier like inversion and perversion sense because like the whole sense is that demons have lost all of their beauty you know, um, but the the richest and most awful way of losing one's beauty is to be almost perfectly beautiful, except mm-hmm. to have something horribly wrong. So, mm-hmm. like the like the 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 the, the, the that really amazing thing with like the lizard snake thing eating Satan's shoulder. Like, I love I love that stuff. You know, like I think it's really really that's probably my favorite one we've talked about so I far. I love it. It's yeah. really powerful. But like from a, a slightly less analogous way of thinking about how evil is present in the world, I think there is something very powerful about thinking that the most evil things look exactly like the most beautiful things, but just with something very small and very critical and very wounded and tragic being very terribly wrong. I I do like where good omens went with this. um, As far as like a modern sexy demon thing goes where, you know, both in the book and then in the show, you know, the demons are ostensibly sexy, but have to wear like sunglasses all the time because their eyes are always um, like snake like and, and terrible. Right. And I, I, I like that idea that there's something, there's the appearance of something good, but there's something really hidden in there that I think is, is if you're going to do that motif, which I think sucks, but if you're going to do that motif, that's probably the cleverest way to do that motif. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably, that's probably true. That's probably true. Um, you know, there is, if I could just use like a particular lens for looking at this, um, the depiction of St. Michael. So we talked about the one, the, the lizard thing eating Satan's shoulder or whatever. That's a St. Michael. Um, but from this period on, Saint, depictions of St. Michael defeating the devil is like a really, it's a very interesting lens to look at to um, to see depictions of Satan. Um, in part because it becomes kind of a normative 
image of Satan when many other normative I- images of Satan vanish. Um, so it's it's a uh, in part it becomes a touch point, like a like a lasting touchstone for depictions of the devil. Um, but also just because it's a beloved devotional and theological top boss, you know, it's in the scriptures and all the rest. So there it is. So like, um, so, okay, real quick, like, I really want to hear your thoughts on these on, on various other kinds of like, like haughty depictions of the devil, but like, um, there, there are some really, really, really interesting examples. So for instance, um, this is really interesting one from and another Spanish guy from the 17th century called Ignacio de, de Rios. Um, it's a painting and you look at it and you have this delicate, almost feminine, but not quite St. Michael, um, in this like very gloriously, very kind of decorative battle gear. Like nobody's actually going to fight a battle in this. So it's, it's all like the, the, sure, the gear yeah, itself is, all is for pomp and circumstance. symbolic, you know, which is like, this is not really necessary. Yeah. It's kind of like David refusing to wear, to wear battle gear. It's like symbolic, you know, um, and it's really interesting because he's totally he's totally effortlessly effortlessly kind of like pushing Satan away with his feet. It's like effortless. Again, like the, the battle against the devil is not this big like you versus me. Again, good omens kind of like the whole world fighting against the whole world. This is kind of effortless, like almost sort of like fey. St. Michael just kind of being like, oh, I'm sorry. Did I, oh, sorry, not sorry. Did I just like accidentally like push you into hell forever? Like, oh, sorry, not sorry. You know, like, oh, let me go get a manicure, you know, which I, which I kind of love to be honest. Um, but what's striking about it is that this, the Satan is like naked, jacked, ripped, you know? So this is like super naked, super, super jacked, um, hunky Satan, who is being like pushed into hell by this kind of like sort of just like light effortless sort of no combat, no big deal. um, St. Michael, Mm -hmm. which is really an interesting way of depicting this where like Satan is the one who's super jacked where it's kind of like Satan has something to prove. Like Satan is fighting somebody. Satan is trying to like, get something up on somebody and like trying to get a, like in like the upper hand um mm-hmm. where like saint michael is not he's like not jacked he's wearing like sort of like a circus costume and he's like not even trying and he pushes this like super jacked superhero well like, you're wearing hell. you're wearing you're wearing pomp and circumstance type armor after you've already had the victory in the battle and now you're doing kind of a uh, uh, victory lap right? uh, you're coming home for more right. you've cleaned the blood off of you everyone's well waiting at the turrets to welcome you home so you put on your nice armor so there's this implication that the you know the battle has already won and that this is just posturing at this point which, which is I did. which is really like cool that. which is really cool it's like because because again like we talked about this with the exorcism episode but like there is a temptation to think like, oh my gosh, I mean, either demons don't exist at all, which is silly, or to be like so obsessed, you know, in one way or the other. You're like, with, so obsessed with my own sins, so obsessed with demons, whatever, that like, it seems in some way that they have like the last word in some silly kind of way. Um, and this is like a total antidote to all of that. It's just like, meh, meh, what do you, what do, you do this afternoon? I don't know. I guess I gotta, I just gotta push Satan into hell forever. Oh, I did it. Okay, bye toodles you know like i kind of love that actually like i do kind of love that um but then there's another depiction of saint michael which is from like all very close to the same time period um from germany though um so whatever and um so it's a it's a 16th century um so just a little bit beforehand 16th century german statue Mm -hmm. it's a statuette though it's a statue not a painting and so here, it's, the emphasis is a little bit different. You see St. Michael more as a warrior. Like, he's he's wearing more serious armor. Um, it's definitely heavenly armor. Like, it's kind of funny. There's a kind of battle skirt. I don't know the proper term for it, but it's kind of a skirt, you know? And it's made of, like... Yeah, sort of a Roman centurion. It's a Roman centurion and, and type, type of thing. Kind of- and it's kind of made of, like, peacock feathers. So it's actually really beautiful because it's, like, resplendently heavenly, but also, like, for battle. You know, so I kind I kind of like sure. it. You know, um, I so anyway, so he's depicted like that, but then the devil that he's trampling on 
is this like weird snake dog beast thing with no human characteristics of any kind and no like sexiness of any kind. Um, it's like this weird demon snake dog beast thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that, that kind of goes on honestly until the present day is that until the present day you have in depictions of St. Michael, which is to say depictions of, of Satan, you will see it either way. So you will generally either see Satan depicted as like a sexy naked dude, or if it's like from contemporary scripts or whatever, like a sexy dude with like a loincloth or whatever. Um, or it's like a snaky monster demon birdie doggy thing. Or we get my favorite depiction. Yes. Which we're just going to take an episode that's massively problematic on every single level and just put a cherry on Tell top more, of it. Yes. Um, I'm kind of a huge fan of the specific aesthetics around Satan that the church of Satan, that the satanic temple has put out. Okay. So um, like personally. goat horns. Cause it, well, it combines all four of your things, right? It's pitch black ripped jacked abs still sexy um goat head pentagram on its head two sets of horns two snakes coming out from where its penis should be okay um so it's all the things all the things that you've talked about um it's just delightfully honest though because every time anybody uses it they're weirdly using it better than most of these things have been used right we're like so i think a particularly good example i was in the news a while back when netflix did its gritty reboot of sabrina the teenage witch oh no um they decided to actually like go for it and like the witches in this show worship satan oh. like the actual biblical satan oh my and he's not a good person and like the reason that sabrina doesn't want to sell her soul and get the magic powers that she was born with is because actually like satan keeps making these really nice promises to people and then horrifying things happen to them as a result <laughs> and he enjoys it he enjoys making that happen and they used this depiction and the satanic temple sued them why um, are you because kidding because they were like you are you are using our depiction of satan uh but basically it was like unflatteringly meaning like you're doing it too honestly right you're um, making satan and look then, bad take this the right way but you're making, yeah, satan, you're making look bad. satan look bad and then and then um to a lesser extent i, I referenced uh the witch the a24 horror movie the witch which is sort oh, of yeah, set cool. in uh yeah like 1600s witch trial times um puritans and all this stuff and um the witches in this like straight up she has like this little black billy goat that she huh. is like praying to and that no like, way. whispers these terrible things to her oh no time. way okay and interesting i just find that really honest in a way that some of these others aren't right because all these others are trying to make a point about satan right but this is just kind of showing satan for what it is which is like really monstrousness like, uh, like all his monstrousness somehow still inexplicably attractive horrifyingly punishing right you know right and i i think that's a motif that i never see and i don't know why the closest this is why i dug it so much the closest that i saw was your hieronymus bosch thing with the with the sort of satanic um religious order but i'm always surprised demons aren't depicted more legalistically mm. right that that like you get you get heaven depicted legalistically because religion is legalistic in people's minds. Right. And then you right. know you get kind of sexy Satan, but like from a religious perspective, like God is rooting for our success and it's the demons supposedly who are sort of ticking off boxes and trying to make us scrupulous and tick off boxes for ourselves and all these things. And to me, in my mind, like if I am, and I guess this is pivoting into sort of the artistic prompt we always give at the end of an episode, but if I'm going and trying to show some element of a demon, specifically i'm going to show the legalism i'm going to depict them as judges i'm going to depict them as a like 
demonic Supreme court. You know what I mean? Like that's kind of how I think of it. And, and, you know, on the one hand, I think there is something, well, I guess I will say the, the sort of satanic temple Baphomet is the closest I've seen to that where it's just so sinister and so punishing and so, and not in a fun cartoonish way, like right. in a very, yeah. like this thing is going to eat you. Yeah. This is bad. Um, this is like a, but for, some reason, situation, but for yeah. some reason you're attracted to it anyway. Like, I think that juxtaposition is important. Now, granted, even in my legalism thing, I do think, and this is what I was trying to say a moment ago, that there is an inherent problem when you depict some aspect of religion only to make one little point about that. I mean, on the one hand, it's hard to avoid, but on the other hand, that's how you get misnomers like sexy demons, right? right? And I think it's important as much as you can to depict something honestly and not just say, oh, well, this is the part of this demon that I want to show, or this is a part of, you know, angels, or this is the part of morality that I wanted to pick, because then you start to get into propaganda and you start to get into things being watered down. So as much as I would like to see more legalism in demons or demon depictions, and as much as I'm surprised that there hasn't been, and it does feel like a vacuous thing, um, I do appreciate the multidimensional stuff that totally inadvertently seemingly by accident, the church of Satan has actually produced and that has sort of popped off in pop culture where you're getting a lot more mainstream, like, Hey, Satan actually like sucks yeah, yeah, and is trying to kill you. And weirdly the church of Satan accidentally did that uh, better than we did. So weird. So, yeah. Right. 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 I'm just going to sit here and drink my cider. Let's <laughs> just listen, ladies and gentlemen, here's how it is. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I do want to turn it over to the artistic prompt, but do you have any hot takes as to why the legalism thing isn't a more explored motif? Because that is the thing that always is very, 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 um, um, like it stands out to me yeah. that, that it's not there. If the absence is felt. Right. I think, I think that that is a most keenly felt, um, 19th and 20th century American problem of the experience of being Christian um, is that we have a very, very, very strong sense of um, uh, God as being an unjust bureaucrat um, whose uh, cruel laws need to be somehow circumvented um, or outsmarted in some kind of a way. Um, and so we are more strongly in likely to produce a vision of um, either God or Satan, because this God doesn't look totally different from Satan, um, that would be very heavy on that kind of emphasis, you know, the kind of legalism type of type of thing. Um, I just think that in the end, because a lot of the kind of popular culture production techniques that we're going to be looking at, especially in films and, and TV, are coming from a kind of post-Christian, non-Christian, ex-Christian perspective, um, I think that we do see it. I just think we see it mostly with God um, because God is, is no, we definitely see it all the time with God. I'm just, I guess mm -hmm. I'm always surprised that it doesn't exist in antiquity in the Renaissance in the, that's, as just, a our problem. About that's just our problem. They had a much richer sense of who God is than we do. Um, no, 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 I don't mean about God. I mean, depicting Satan mm -hmm. that way. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm surprised no, but it's, that Satan it's only, isn't depicted legalistically. it's only, it, that's only scary if you have a very shallow vision of God. Like, um, the, the, oh, that's, that's, no, no, that's what I mean. This is what I mean. Like they had a much greater, richer sense of who God is. And so their sense of who the devil was, was, um, very different. Like we have a very shallow sense of who God is and a very shallow sense of what he wants and what is, can you, can you elaborate on that for me? Because so one of the things, I don't remember which episode it was from, but one of the things that really surprised me, you were talking about Christ, um, being depicted early on in the church as a judge mm -hmm. and my experience of that as a child of my culture is pretty unilaterally negative, right? Judges are bad, not just God is bad, but like judges are bad. Right. Um, and even the Bible, right? Like the judge who does not render a, 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 a right verdict in Christ's parable and has to be nagged by the widow. Right. Um, I'm, I'm combining two things, but you know what I mean? They're in the same breath. Uh, but you were very enlightening there saying like, no, no, no. Like the idea of crisis judge is like, this is God 
avenging the injustices that have been done against you. Like this is a group of people who feel that injustice has been done to them and they are looking for a righteous judge to come in and say, no, 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 I, I judge the people who have hurt you. I'm protecting you. I'm, I'm in the same way, a good shepherd. I am yeah. a good judge. Yeah. Right. So is it that, is it that they had a richer understanding of God? Probably. I want to hear you elaborate on that. Or is it just that our understanding of law has also changed? And like, we now see like, like, like maybe back then, quote unquote, whenever back then was like demons aren't being depicted legalistically because the law isn't actually primarily seen as something that holds you back even secularly in a way that it is now. I don't know. I'm just musing here, but yeah, I mean, certainly the power of the power of law. I mean, it wasn't a bureaucratic system. And so that's very different. Um, and so Christ sitting as judge is not like Christ sitting on the Supreme Court, which is a very different sense of being a judge, you know. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that sense of being Christ being a judge, like why is that very liberating? It's because ultimately you say that like I entrust, like I looking to Christ as judge, although it can be a fearful thing, and that people talk about it being a fearful thing, and so I don't, I'm not going to gloss over that. But like ultimately looking to Christ as judge means two things. It means one, um, uh, that justice will actually be rendered. So when I experience terrible injustice, when I um, recognize that there is nothing that's going to happen in this world that's going to be able to bring, to rectify the evil that's been done, you know, to me or people I love or whatever, um, I can trust in love that like justice will actually be rendered, you know, that this is not just going to like drop into an abyss and never be heard from again, but like justice will actually be rendered mm -hmm. here. Um and and simultaneously that like I and then I think about my own evil that I've done that like I both want this is the crime and punishment problem right like from Dostoevsky like I both want and need the evil that I've done myself personally to be requited to have justice rendered in a way that I cannot render um, and I also can't bear it because if I'm if I'm required to pay back what I owe I will be destroyed. You know, I can't, I can't even in eternity, I can't, I can't pay back what I owe, you know? Um, and so, mm -hmm. um, so there's this incredible trust in God's mercy as well, that like what happens on the cross is that like he commits fully to paying, to rendering justice and he commits fully to being himself the one who pays the price for that justice by like mm -hmm. enacting it in the human person, like enacting it in my own person, but bearing the pain of it himself, you know, so that like, right. this is the unity of Christ's mercy and his justice, right? So like he gives us both at once. Um, so that's very beautiful, you know, so I can see it and I can trust it and like, I can look at it and I can think about all the ways in which like, um, that's very beautiful. And then I can look at all the ways in which like beauty is marred by selfishness and by self-destruction, by inversion, by perversion, by, you know, um, things that I'm afraid of, even in ways that are, you know, giving into my own weaknesses, you know, but like I can trust in that judgment of God. Mm. Um, I think in the modern era, like we lose a trust in the actual goodness of God. I think ultimately, and I would say we lose a trust in the goodness of God. And so we very, very, very fundamentally lose a sense that God's justice and God's mercy are united. We come to th see them as radically opposed. And they're not just opposed, but we come to see them as like two separate things. And then we come to see that like, maybe God just doesn't have any mercy. You know, he's just justice. right? Or maybe we think that he's only mercy and he's not justice at all which is a different kind of mistake. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so we have visions of Satan that come from that, you know? So if we think that he's, um, if we think God is only justice, then we already have a very, and we live in a bureaucratic society, then we already have a very bureaucratic notion that God is just like a psycho, nightmarish Kafka. I mean, this is like the trial, like the Kafka is the trial, you know? Um, it's mm -hmm. like yeah. nightmare vision of a, of a judge who makes no sense, who places 
who charges you guilty with a crime that you haven't done that he says that you have done and you can't disprove it and like it's original sin right you know um and like it just the more you think about it the worse it gets and then eventually like if you accept his false premises then he tears your heart out and like that's it and then you die um so like at that point basically god looks like the devil and so it doesn't totally surprise me that we have like the primary depiction of of satan is in the contemporary moment is like either like a hot sexy whatever um or just like raw ugliness and just deal with it you know just Mm -hmm. just freaking deal with it you know because if it's just a matter of justice which is reconceived as just a matter of power then like just take your take your pick you know i mean this is ultimately the point of um good omens like um terry pratchett and neil gaiman's good omens is like take your freaking pick like god is just as bad as the devil so just take your pick you know um Mm -hmm. yeah it's all interesting things to think about are there any let's let's throw it over to the prompt i mean are there any key themes that you think are unexplored or any key premises that you think should be included uh, or at least discerned when depicting these things as an artist in whatever medium is yours. Yeah. I mean, I do think, I think it's an important thing to realize that like your depiction of devils will necessarily begin from your depiction, from your sense of who God is. Um, and that it's going to be an inversion of that or a perversion or a projection of your own sense of what's bad and scary, you know, the Ethiopians. Um, or your your own sense of like repressed um your own repressed longing so the hotties you know um so you have to start from that recognition that like that's what's got that is literally in ineluctably what's going to happen and so i don't know i mean like maybe maybe depict a demon and like learn from that who you think god is and if you don't like that Mm. god maybe take a while about why you don't and maybe think and pray and work for a while see if you understand like what is it about me that makes me want to have god look like this in a way that i actually don't like you know um and maybe see if that like helps me understand who god is a little bit better and if i understand who god is a little bit better then maybe I can make more compelling claims about what a devil might look like. You know, I would say like the pitfall, the pitfall is that you make an Ethiopian. Like that's the worst thing that can, that can happen to you as an artist is that you can make an Ethiopian, which is that like you just are acting out of your own like personal baggage that you haven't processed. Right. And just like, what does, right. what does God look like? I don't know, an Ethiopian. Meh. Um... And I think a lot of the hotties are basically Ethiopians, if putting it met- metaphorically speaking. I think a lot of the hotties are kind of sure. like Ethiopians, you know? Um, so the worst thing you can do is make an Ethiopian, which is just like, no, oh, I don't know, I have baggage. So like, I don't know, I guess that's probably what I say, what the devil, I mean, like Lucifer, like the Lucifer TV show is just a bunch of, I mean, it's just, oh my gosh, it's just a bunch of work, yeah, working, yeah, totally. working out personal baggage, you know? So like, I would say, but I mean, I think that that could be an interesting prompt, like as an artist, like maybe just do that, like just recognize that that's the role demons we can serve personally in art as a motif yeah and and draw what you think a demon looks like and then sort of counter infer what you think god is based on that yeah. use it as sort of an ink block to uh, an ink blot test for yourself a raw shot i think test that could yourself. really well, i think it could be very interesting honestly i think it'd be really fruitful well with that i mean go go figure out who demons are and then figure out who god is and uh go forth and create cool things This has been Created Things, an art, soul, and mind production with Jacob Flores Popcheck and Father Gabriel Toretta. Production by Kyle Meineke and Jessica Flores. Theme song by Federico Carranza. For more on the podcast and on its hosts, visit artsoulandmind.com.